So with that, I'm going to welcome our first speaker today, which is Robin from uh, Kungla Biblioteket. So please go ahead, Robin. Uh, yes. As uh, Magnus already said, uh, we are from uh, the National Library of Sweden, uh, Kungliga Biblioteket, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, wave to vec as uh, Martin has trained a couple of uh, those wave to vec models, and uh, they might be interesting for the well NLP world of uh, Sweden. And uh, what I will do in the next uh, 20 to 25 minutes. Let's talk a little bit in general about automatic speech recognition because I'm so arrogant to assume that you know as little as I do about that. So it might be good to have a little bit of uh, background. And um, then I will uh, introduce some of the wave to vec papers because the model that Martin trained is wave to vec 2.0. And how did we come to 2.0 and what else is there? And uh, to give you a little bit of a, a reading guide or an overview. Um, I think I want to close this. Um, all right, so automatic speech recognition is essentially transforming an analog acoustic wave of uh, signals into text. So here we have um, uh, the sound wave for somebody saying it's time for lunch. And what we want to do in speech recognition is simply, well, get in the sound wave and get out the string. Um, if we align a sentence with the sound wave, like here we have the sentence, she just had a baby, um, we can already see that there are some things that we can directly extract from the sound wave and um, locate them to the, to the string. So for example, the letter, the sound B, uh, is essentially a lot of silence followed by a little explosion. And this information we want the, the speech recognition system to essentially do for us. And not only the letter B is a little bit uh, characteristic, other phones and phonemes have also particular forms. So for example, here we have um, the word or the, the pronunciation of she and the sh in the beginning is essentially just noise, as typical for most fricative sounds. And the vowel E is actually quite regular. So with this information, we can already tell different groups of sounds apart or different, different phonemes, we can tell them apart. Uh, since we generally don't know where does a certain sound start and where does it end, we're going to cut our sound signal into little windows of about 25 milliseconds and then shift them around. If you know convolutional neural networks, this might seem very familiar. And the signal uh, inside those windows is essentially stationary, or this is at least our assumption. For mathematical reasons, we do another little thing, which is uh, when cutting the window, we want to smooth the edges. So we don't want to have it completely straight, but we want to smooth it with a hemming window, uh, with a hemming function. And what the does for us is essentially give us some mathematical properties that we need for the next step. If we now look at the, the waveform for a pronunciation or for the vowel a, like in the word head, uh, we can see that um, it's actually a repeating pattern. And it's not, uh, this repeating pattern has four peaks. So one, two, I don't think, I don't know if you see my mouse button, but you can see uh, four peaks. And uh, those peaks are characteristic, uh, characteristic for different vowels. And with uh, some Fourier transformation, we can get this information about where, where are those peaks? So which frequencies are those that uh, are getting amplified? And uh, so here we have a spectrum. So, so we have the frequency at the x-axis and the the uh, amplitude of the loudness on the y-axis. And we can see that, uh, for example, at about 950 uh, frequency kilohertz or hertz, um, the sound is being amplified at about 1,800, uh, it's being amplified. And then once again at 3,100, it's amplified. And these little windows, if we plot them over time, we get a spectrogram where now the peaks 
are marked by the dark part. And here we have three different vowels, uh, which are E and U. And we can see that all of them have essentially three peaks on different positions. So if we were a, a, a good phonetician, we could read a spectrogram and read the text, what is being said directly off of it. Uh, why does this happen? So when we are speaking, we change, uh, especially for vowels, if we change the way we pronounce vowels, they're the, chain, they're the way our mouth and the whole resonance corpus essentially of our head uh, is being, uh, being changed. And this allows certain frequencies to be amplified. And uh, well, this is essentially what we want to pick up on, on our speech recognition system. That if I pronounce an R, then there are some frequencies that get amplified more than when I pronounce an E. And that depends on the shape of, of the mouth. As those spectrograms are a little bit, they contain a little bit too much information for a speech recognition system. We want to make it a little bit more easy. And instead of looking at the whole spectrum of frequency, we're going to look at frequency bands. Uh, so instead of looking at 8,000 values, we're going to look at M values. And we're using a filter bank for that with um, these uh, triangular filters. And so if we have a value that is, let's say, around here, then it's going to be activated um, by two different filters. And we will get some value on those two triangles according to where in the frequency range, um, um, well, the sound is. And human hearing is logarithmic. So as you might have noticed, these filters are spread out very close together in the beginning and very far apart uh, at the end. This is because human hearing is logarithmic in telling frequencies apart. So we are much better at the telling frequencies apart in low frequencies than the high frequencies. And when you hear about male filter banks as, as a feature, you usually hear about them as log male filter banks. This is also because we then take the logarithm of the amplitude values, so of these values here. Um, also because human hearing is uh, essentially logarithmic when it comes to amplitude or loudness. So the decibel scale is also uh, logarithmic. And this, with these log metal filter banks, we would have a classical uh, feature for speech recognition. If you're a little bit more old, old school, you might think, okay, the next step is going to be male frequency sepstral coefficients. But nowadays, this uh, seems to have fallen out of favor uh, as neural networks are, well, more than able to deal with these log metal filter banks as features. They don't need any more simplification. A uh, speech recognition system then simply works by reading in the signal computing the log mail filter bank features, doing some subsampling to just have uh, fewer inputs that we then put into our neural network. And that one will then predict for each of those inputs uh, an output letter. Um, how does that exactly work like? Um, so since we do not know where does the word start and where does it end, and in our data sets, we don't have a perfectly aligned text to, to speech signals. We simply have a speech signal and the text. Uh, what the model then has to learn is that uh, is to align by itself and that it does with connectionist temporal classification or CTC. And for each input, the uh, little sound bite or window, um, it will then predict a letter and some letters like uh, for this string, um, um, no, some, some sounds will be a bit longer than others. So their prediction will consist of multiple times of the same letter, and they will then get fused together to the same letter. If we have some silences, we can predict a blank token. And when we have words where we want to fuse letters together, like these two L's are becoming one L, 
but in the final string, we still want to have two L's in the string. We then can also predict another blank token simply to say that I don't want to fuse everything together here. Please let me have two consonants in a row. And this is essentially how a standard speech recognition system works. Um, when it comes to evaluation, we generally use um, a word error rate. So given the reference string or the gold string, uh, how many insertions, substitutions, and deletions do I need to do in order to, to have my predicted string match this reference string? Um, if you predict something else than words, for example, phonemes, then you don't have a word error rate, but phoneme error rate. So if you read some papers and it's not W-E-R, but P-E-R, then it's gonna be phoneme error rate. Wave to vec is a, a model introduced by Facebook AI research in 2019. And what they did here is uh, unsupervised pre-training for speech recognition. So they used unlabeled data to first pre-train a model um, to, to, well, to pre-train this, this model and then use those uh, inputs instead of these pre-trained vectors uh, as features instead of the classical logmail filter bank features. And what they're doing here is that they have, um, they have the, the input wave and they use first an encoder convolutional network to, to get uh, essentially feature vectors that cover about 30 milliseconds. Then they use another convolutional network um, to mix those latent representations that to get some uh, uh, longer representations. And with these contextualized representations, they use a contrastive loss to, to predict, um, or well, not to predict future, future representations, uh, but rather to, um, to they train the model to distinguish future or likely future representations from any other representation. So this way the model uh, learns that if I have uh, this as my, my context, uh, then these types of sounds are likely to follow. So it's a little bit uh, maybe like a GPT uh, transformer model. Uh, comparing those self-supervised representations with logmail filter bank features in a, uh, in a uh, well, ASR system, uh, we can see that especially when there's uh, only a few hours of labeled data, we gain quite the improvement over simply only training with those uh, eight hours of labeled data, for example. So if we have a lot of unlabeled uh, sound data, we can use uh, wave to vec to, to gain essentially a, a big advantage in, uh, in having some proper pre-trained um, feature vectors. Uh, the next in line is VQ wave to vec where VQ stands for vector quantization. And the difference here is this little Q, a quantization module. So we use essentially the same setup as for wave to vec but uh, as an intermediate step, we exchange those uh, latent representations with uh, representations taken from a code book that is then also trained. But those representations from a code book are more or less discrete. And this helps us also because we know that phonemes are discrete. There's only a limited number of phonemes. So we don't, we don't need to be able to uh, predict or model all kinds of variations of phonemes. We only have a finite number of those, which we essentially are able to with these uh, quantized representations. And the other nice thing with quantized or discrete uh, representations is that we can use BERT to do some further fine tuning. And using those newly fine tuned representations, we can then again put a, uh, an acoustic model on top to do some proper speech recognition. Now, 
the quantization that are doing is uh, is a little bit interesting. So these feature vectors, they they put th them through a Gumbel softmax or Gumbel softmax. I don't know. And why is it a, a Gumbel softmax? Simply because it's differentiable. So when we're doing back propagation, we want to be able to to learn on the way back with a normal softmax that wouldn't be possible. And after creating essentially a probability distribution, we take the index which has the highest probability. And then this index gives us, uh, well, the, the code book vector that we want to use further in, in training uh, our model or in, in the final acoustic model. In wave to vec 2.0, uh, the model changed a little bit more. Um, we still have a convolutional neural network at the bottom to get uh, uh, some latent speech representations. And we also have a, a quantizer to get some quantized uh, representations as well. So the same thing with the code book. But this time we um, don't use them directly to train. We use them more as a target to train forward to, uh, towards to. And the other difference is also that they have a transformer here. Um, so what they're learning here is now to, to make the, the output of the transformer, to, to make this one, um, uh, to make this, uh, to fit this to be close to these quantized representations. So what we're doing here more or less is like, uh, in, in BERT is a mask language, uh, mask language model, but with quantized uh, representations. Uh, the second term in the loss is a diversity loss, which is simply there in order to, to force um, the system to use all of the codebook vectors. So the main magic that happens is in the upper part in the LM. For fine tuning, then they add a linear layer on top to predict the output classes, which can then be, as, as I showed, letters or phonemes. And for that, they use the contextualized representations. So they use um, these, and they don't use those quantized representations. Those only exist um, for the purpose of training the context representations and the rest of the network. And then they use. CTC once again to match the features to the outputs. And here the results are even more impressive, I would say. And in this case, they, they used only 10 minutes of uh, labeled data and nearly 60,000 hours of unlabeled data, which is a lot. But well, uh, if you have that, but you don't want to label it, then this is a good thing to have because you get some pretty good performance with that. So the system with only 10 minutes of labeled data and 60,000 hours of unlabeled data is uh, performing better than some previous models using 100 hours of labeled data. And of course, wave to vec performs once again better than everybody else. Uh, however, when it comes to using a lot of hours, so in this case, 960 hours, the difference is not so so big anymore with compared to previous models. And I have my doubt that this difference is going to be statistically significant, but it works. And I guess this is quite nice nonetheless. Now, what does the model learn? So these latent speech representations that we made discrete with the quantization, uh, we can see how do they co-occur with, uh, with phonemes when we train uh, on, well, on a different data set. And it seems to be actually the case that there are some representations that co-occur with uh, certain phonemes. So that is very nice. And something that also makes a lot of sense uh, to me anyways, is that for the example here, we have uh, the representations that um, co-occur with the, with the sound S. So the uh, voiceless uh, alveolar fricative, um, that these representations are also active when we have the, the voice counterparts so or the, the z. And this also happens the other way around. So these representations seem to really map to, <clears throat> to actual speech sounds, so actual phonemes.
next up is cross-lingual speech uh, uh, recognition, um, the XLSR. And uh, this is essentially the same model as with wave to vec 2.0, but instead of training only on language data, they trained on multilingual data sets. And um, which is uh, nice because the models benefit from each other. So uh, languages that sound similar will use uh, similar latent representations. So if we plot them somehow into uh, some space, uh, we'll see that languages, these languages, for example, that have very similar sounding, uh, that are very similar sounding are plotted together and then also other languages like English, German, and French, for example, German and French with the beautiful sounds are also close together. So if you have a language that does not have a lot of, a lot of labeled data, you can use a multilingual model and then still benefit from uh, some, some multilingual uh, unsupervised or self-supervised pre-training. Um, Going a little bit further, you can also use wave to vec for, um, well, self-training. And what they did here is they trained a wave to vec model, uh, labeled some data, and then used that newly labeled data to, to train a new model. And this is once again, something really nice. For example, when you have, you start out with a multilingual model, you only have a couple of minutes of labeled data. You use that to, to train your own model. Um, you label some more data, and with that new data, you can then continue training a, a even better model. Um, they also have done recently some wave to vec U, meaning unsupervised speech recognition. So when you don't have any uh, labeled data and you also don't want to go through the hassle of creating 10 minutes of uh, labeled data, then you can uh, still get your speech recognition system running. Uh, using some generative uh, adversarial networks. And the latest uh, trend is uh, Hubert, which is not having a wave to vec in its name anymore, but uh, still belongs to the same family. What they're doing here is that instead of um, having essentially random targets from a code book in the beginning, uh, they use in early iterations, melt frequency, substrate coefficients. Uh, and they, they uh, on the whole data set, they compute all those MFCC vectors, cluster them, and then use those clusters as uh, targets for these discrete uh, representations. And later exchange those MFCC representations with uh, learned latent representations to get even better. And then there's also wave to vec uh, too much. Uh, so this is a little bit of a disclaimer. There's more than just wave to vec. Uh, this is just now my view on the topic in order to introduce it to, to you. Um, the model recently gained a lot of traction due to its performance on just when using only very little labeled data, um, but also due to its cross-lingual uh, pre-trained models which are available with uh, Facebook's own FairSec and also Hugging Face, which you then can easily use to, to fine tune your own model and then maybe create your own new bigger data sets using some uh, pseudo labeling and so on. And with that, I hope there was enough information to, to get sort of a little bit of an overview and not be too confused, but maybe even more confused. So I will give it away to, to Martin. So we may get feedback. Oh, okay, excellent. Um, okay. Okay. 
Yes, hi, thank you uh, for having me. Uh, my name is like uh, Magnus Söd, Martin Marsen. I work as a data scientist and IT architect at the National Library, uh, Kungliga Biblioteket. Uh, this presentation is basically about the training that we've done um, uh, corpus that we have at the National Library. Um, Hearing Voices at the National Library, eller Sju Sköna Schimpanser regisserar Chilean's Kanger Fiction. Uh, ni, uh, you, you probably understand it later. Some of you, or most of you understand why this is a, maybe a problem in speech to text. But, but first, I'd like to point out that th there's sort of a cultural advantage here for cultural heritage institutions. Uh, unsupervised pre-training, um, sort of the fact that you can do a lot of unsupervised pre-training and then use a small amount of data to for, for fine-tuning uh, is, I uh, don't, don't really want to use the word game changer, but it sort of is for cultural heritage institutions. We tend to have vast collections um, of speech or uh, text or images, uh, but they're usually not in a format or they've, they've not until now been in a format that been easily used for for AI for example but we, when we do a lot of unsupervised pre-training it becomes very simple you just dump all your data into the pre-training and uh, and then and that becomes valuable and you can share that uh, model with others that want to do fine tuning for it so for example the uh, oh wait that's another slide or I, I could say, for example, for text, uh, the Royal Library has vast resources of texts, of course, with newspapers and the uh, books, uh, which are very good for, for doing pre-training for, uh, for example, BERT or transform models. Uh, the same um, the reason why uh, the Royal Library created this KB Lab was to understand its own collections, but also find a way to contribute uh, without uh, sort of giving away the data, because we can't, because of copyright, you understand. Um, there's also a democracy aspect to this, um, of course, if, I mean, we have an enormous amount of data uh, with uh, different dialects, if we could, if, if we can help uh, provide a better speech to text, uh, even if you're not from Stockholm, then, uh, then that's sort of in line with the overarching goal of, of libraries. Um, and this, again, is why KB has a lab to begin with. Um, there's another aspect of this, which is this AI. Uh, transcription of uh, Swedish. Um, we need to, I think, do better. So uh, models that anyone can use is probably a good thing. Um, I'll come back to that later. So, I think at least. So um, there are a few models. Uh, Robin named them, or a few of them. There's the XLSR 53, which is Facebook's model um, made from 53 languages, I think. 70,000 hours or something like that, uh, including Swedish, not a lot of Swedish. You can use it. Uh, it performs fairly well, I think. But then uh, Facebook came out with the Vox Populi, which is trained on 16,000 hours of speech from the European Parliament. Uh, this is, I'm speculating a bit, but I think that one of the problems with that, apart from it being a, uh, having a non-commercial license, is that it is... Uh, my guess is that the European Parliament, there's not a lot of dialects spoken there. Um, I, I could be wrong, but uh, my guess is, is that. Um, which is why we uh, decided to tr try to train a, sort of a Swedish model uh, based on, on, on a broader, um, be, being broader regarding dialects and types of speech. Uh, it's still a work in progress. We call it Voxerex because well, you get it. Um, I'll talk about it. Um, so, of course, it always starts with data. Um, again, the KB has, has vast collections. That's 10 million hours of audiovisual material, which is, um, well, we, we get a lot daily. 
and we have legal deposits um, from both Swedish radio and TV, of course, but we also have audiobooks and podcasts. So we're in a very great situation in that we don't really need to find all the speech. <laughs> we can just throw away 75% of speech that we, we deem it not uh, perhaps too hard, or uh, so we can just sort of filter out the speech that we need because we have a lot of it, which is precisely what we've done. Um, we've tried to create this corpus or tried, we have created this corpus called the P4 corpus. P4 is the uh, program Fyra, I guess, uh, Swedish public uh, radio has uh, local radio. I mean, it is still public radio, but it's local radio um, all over the country. Um, so we made uh, sort of a few variants of this corpus with uh, 10 hours, 100 hours, 10 hours you, can, you can see. Um, we could go up to two million hours uh, if we wanted to, but uh, the, I don't think there's a point to it right now. Maybe if, if there's a, even, an even bigger model, that could be, there could be a point to that. Um, but this is public radio. It's not commercial. It's not uh, what's called NAR radio. Um, it contains basically anything. I mean, there's news, there's people calling in. Uh, so local dialects. Um, so it's it's aimed to be, and it is a, a fairly broad corpus. Then again, if, if something is too noisy, it's probably thrown away uh, in the uh, sort of uh, while while building the corpus. Um, we also have audiobooks and podcasts. In this in this sort of in this first version of VoxX, there's uh, one thousand five hundred hours of mixed speech. Um, there's mainly audiobooks, which I mean, audiobooks are good because the, it's, it's very uh, professional speakers, very, very good in a sense. But then again, it's the same voice for multiple hours. So then again, it, it seems that mixing these two categories is beneficial, or it is. So not surprisingly, the, sort of the training regimen is the same as for every type of training for this, you do, you convert your, you create your corpus, you uh, convert your corpus to a format that is suitable for training. Um, in this case, you need to create the manifest files, um, which is weirdly specific to mention, but that was one of the, that's one of the things that you, you need to do. And, and that was at least before badly documented. Then there's pre-training and create manifest files for the fine tuning, do the fine tuning, evaluate and hopefully celebrate. Uh, if, if you're better than Facebook, then you can celebrate. Um, when it comes to pre-training, you have a choice if you want to do this yourself. Uh, there's the fair like library, which is um, created by Facebook, which is the original code uh, created to, uh, to for this model. I mean, it's, it's a bit finicky <laughs> if you're not used to it. Uh, it has some quirks. I think they're working on it. Uh, on the other hand, it is the original code. So, I mean, you know it works, or at least it works worked for them. Uh, it also is it, it, very good at uh, telling you sort of if, if you want to emulate 120 GPUs, because you don't have 120 GPUs every day, someday, but not all the time. Um, so it's it's fairly easy to follow in their footsteps uh, using Fairsec once you've sort of learned the finicky bits. On the other hand, there's Hugging Face. Everyone loves Hugging Face. Uh, so probably easier to start with. Um, I haven't tried it. We use Fairsec. So uh, my guess is that it has worked very well. On the other hand, if it doesn't work, you don't know if it's your code or if it's Hugging Face, it doesn't work. So. Uh, I, if, if had I started now, I would have started with Hugging Face just to, to see if I could replicate Facebook's results. Um, and if I couldn't, then sort of revert back to Fairsec. Um, the, the, the Voxrex that we've trained is trained for 200,000 steps. The, uh, um, I think uh, the, the big wave to vec is trained for 800,000 or close to a million. Uh, so this is, and you'll see the graph later, uh, there's definitely room for improvement. I have one tip though, if you're doing this, which is use Docker. You probably already know this, but use Docker because uh, some of these uh, dependencies are 
again, finicky to install uh, for the right version. So use Docker. There's a very good container uh, that NVIDIA maintains and releases regularly. Use the, sort of start with that, install all the Fairsec stuff into that container, and then, or, 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 or um, inherit from that container and uh, install your dependencies and work from there. That's, that's, I wish I had <laughs> started with that. That's, that's part of that. Um, so, I mean, the, this is just, I mean, the, there's a very good, there's a readme file that's very short. You can just read that uh, and it makes it seem very straightforward. It wasn't exactly that straightforward because you need to learn about the manifests and at least before they didn't document that properly. And my tip uh, with this is basically, I mean, read the readme file and then go read the documentation for that command because you're not actually using that command. And you're using that command, but you're using a, a configuration file, which is where you do all your config. You need to map the parameters to the config file. Um, just, just small stuff, but do that. Um, so when we train this, uh, this is the accuracy graph or accuracy plots of the training. Uh, as you can see, there's room for improvement. It, it could be that it levels off exactly at the end, but I don't, you know, it seems like it's going to go for a while more. Um, so, which is why I said it's a work in progress. We're still training. Uh, this is, I think, around three weeks of training. Um, so we, we're currently uh, creating a, a even larger corpus and doing even more training uh, to see if we can get an even better model. Um, when it comes to fine tuning, uh, same thing. You can fine tune with Fairsec. It's it's very easy. Um, in this case, I would use Hugging Face if I were you. Um, just again, the the, sort of the Hugging Face datasets API is is uh, is a huge advantage here. Be, you don't need to download a lot of files, create the manifests. You can. There's very very little code to to fine tune using uh, Hugging Face. Um, so. The data sets that we've used, uh, there are three main data sets. There's the NST data set, which I think is from a company that went bankrupt, was sold, or was bought by IBM, and then the data was uh, sort of just uh, given to the Norwegian Språkbanken. Um, honestly, when I wrote this, I realized I don't remember how many hours, but we're talking like 50 hours of annotated uh, Swedish, which is amazing. Uh, different dialects. Um, again, a bit finicky to, to work with. Uh, I hope someone has uploaded that to Hugging Face now. Uh, they really should. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful resource. Um, different dialects. Uh, yeah, this is very good. Uh, then there's Common Voice. Uh, which has 12 hours in, in uh, 6.1 and 35 hours in, in 7.0. Um, we haven't used 7.0 yet. So sort of in the, the next model we, we've used, uh, we'll use uh, uh, version 7. So it'll be even better. Then we created what we call LP4, which is the data, a data set that we created in-house uh, specifically uh, for a subset of the P4 data um because we we didn't really know <laughs> how how that um we, we didn't know that much about the data sets and one one way of knowing it is of course to ask people to uh, annotate it uh i would say use hugging face of course that's my that's my tip for, for fine tuning oh wait i don't really see this so just, um here we go uh this is the loss curves no, yes, no, no, sorry, this is the word error rate for, um, hang on, why is it, all uh, oh, right, this is the, uh, the word error rate during training for a, a wave to vector that is trained only on P4, uh, which is the blue one, and uh, the red one is Voxrex, and the uh, yellow one is Vox Populi. So, um, as you can see, uh, adding these audiobooks uh, made a, I mean, it's not a huge impact, but it, it, it is an impact. Uh, and they're both better than, than uh, Vox Populi. So um, yeah, 
and maybe there's not that much more to gain from further training. It, it, it's, it gets very flat at the end. Um, but still, it's, um, it, performs, it performs well. Oh, there we go. So for, for the, uh, the example that I had in the, uh, the beginning, you can see at the end there, it gets Sjöstjärna Kampans regisserar and then Chileans genre fiction, or Chileans genre fiction. No, uh, it, it doesn't get that. Um, on the other hand, I thought this was pretty good. Um, it tends to become fairly um, phonetic if, if it doesn't know words. If there's no, I mean, there's no dictionary uh, here. It, um, there's only um, uh, syllables and uh, and uh, uh, characters. So uh, if it hasn't seen Chileansk, well, that's fine, I guess. Um, but this is, I mean, this is the raw sort of the raw performance without any uh, that comes straight out of the C2C classifier. Um, one way to do this better, which they also use in the wave to wave paper, is of course to couple the output with a some kind of language model, which can then it can both. Um, uh, what do you say? Oh, anyway, you. I mean, the, the, the classification can be wrong, but people also tend to uh, say things differently. If you're saying "hon var egentligen regissör," people will probably say "egentligen" sometimes. They will say "regissör" sometimes. Both those errors have nothing to do with the sort of acoustic model, um, but the acoustic model could be wrong as well. So if you couple this with a language model, you can sort of revert it back to the correct, the correct form for some definition of correct. Um, I mean, it's if, if, if what you want is is uh, text as it was written, then yes, that's on the right. Is that that's the correct text? But they didn't actually say that. Um, but that's a philosophical discussion. Uh, linguists and uh, uh, Sprock Technologer can uh, talk about that. So there are a few ways to do that. You can do rescoring. If you if you have a if you, you have some some kind of uh, language model, um, for example, foreground model, you can use uh, Viterbi and Beam Search to try to find sort of the most likely correct uh, uh, sentence. Um, which is what we've used, we, we've tried. Um, there is, I realize I haven't, had, I don't have a slide for that, but as soon as you start using a language model, that language model is, of course, um, if there's a bias or if there's, uh, I mean, the language model won't be perfect so that it will um, uh, impact the results. They're very, very, um, noticeable for us because we made two language models, one based on social media and one based on uh, the, the S over sort of government publications. The language model used based on social media was better at uh, transcribing than the other one. And this is speculation, a very, very much speculation, but it could be, of course, that sort of social media text lies closer to spoken uh, to, to speech than written government publications. Speculation, <laughs> we'll have to investigate, but uh, it, it was a very uh, noticeable, uh, noticeably better uh, if we use the social media. So that's that's actually the one that we, we've been using. Um, so a foreground model, you can use the, something called KNLM, you can use to build that model. Unsurprisingly, a transform model is better. Um, but again, you're sort of straying from the raw performance of the acoustic model into something that would provide a better result. Uh, but I, my sort of view on this is there will be many models. Uh, there will be many sort of desired results. There will be many applications for this, but we concentrate on the, the sort of the raw, uh, the pre-trained model. Uh, that's basically our job. That, that would, that's what we can contribute. And performance uh, is uh, it's good. <laughs> it's hard to <laughs> it's hard to um, sort of evaluate it against the real world, but um, it's better than XLSR. It's better than Vox Populi um, with the foreground social model than the uh, Common Voice. We get the 
what I understand, a very good score. But as you can see, this social, uh, sort of the, the social foreground language model hurts performance uh, on the NST test set, which is uh, maybe not so weird, uh, depending on what, what type of text they have in the NST uh, data set. If we want to do some sort of qualitative uh, not quantitative analysis of this or, or uh, evaluation, then if we take, this is 30 seconds of PFR local radio uh, without the language model. Uh, I'm not saying that this it's like this all the time, but there's two, there's two characters wrong in 30 seconds. That's pretty good. Um, of course, there's not that many names in this. Uh, there's no uh, sort of uh, embedded English because that gets very weird. Uh, but for us, sort of, if you look at the uh, uh, the collections from the National Library, we have again huge collections that are not described at all. Uh, we're basically saying uh, this program goes here, and that's it. And this lets us actually look into the programs and see if uh, we make it searchable or do some sort of, sort of analysis on it, even though it's not perfect. The, the situation is very, uh, very close to OCR, where, where OCR was for maybe 15 years ago, that it's not perfect, but it works. Um, another type of, of um, evaluation, I don't know if you, you saw this, uh, I thought it was very unfair, um, actually, but it's, I think, what is uh, public, public televisions um, automatic transcription of uh, local TV broadcast said that 48% of alla jävla borgare uh, skulle kunna cykla. Is jävla borgare, I guess the Dan Bourgeoisie of jävla borg, uh, should have been jävla borgare, of course. Um, my guess, again, speculation, my guess is that they're using uh, uh, vocabulary or the language model, some, something that they allow it to um, Sort of, you get better performance if you just look at how many words that are in that dictionary when you evaluate it. But on the other hand, if there's some something shows up that's not in the dictionary, it will pick something in the dictionary. We see that in OCR all the time. Uh, lot of speculation in this presentation, but that's my guess. Uh, when you allow it to use the uh, uh, basically the, the phonetics instead, then you don't get that type of error. For example, COVID-19, I think became Korvana 19 or something like that uh, on Sveriges Radio, uh, whereas our model says COVID-19, but with a K instead of a C, but it's perfectly understandable. Uh, and I have to say that the, sort of the, the critique against this is very unfair because, I mean, this is, I mean, even Jävla I mean, that's funny, but a lot of it is correct. And it's, it's a huge deal to have uh, have all of, for people uh, that are hard of hearing. It's, it's a huge deal to have to have some uh, text there instead. So uh, we've gotten some reactions. Uh, simply missing. So, uh, so I guess it's um, I guess it depends on what you need it for, uh, what I'm saying. So I was going to show you a short demo of how, how we use it, but it's, uh, I realized that I have a networking problem with our, our VPN doesn't work with Zoom and Zoom doesn't work with our VPN. So I'm just going to show this. Uh, what we did was, and, I can, and, now you, and you can't hear the, the thing, which is too bad, but um, we used the model to transcribe all of the Swedish channels, uh, audio and uh, radio and television, um, between uh, three days before and after uh, uh, 27, now 28 uh, February 1906, which if you, you're old enough, you know what that is. That's uh, when Ulf Palme got shot. Um, and here's, a, here's an, an interesting thing. If you just search for music, then of course you get this type of uh, graph, not very important, uh, very interesting. But if you search for Ulf Palme, then you get this. Uh, Ulf Palme is of course mentioned before he was shot. He was prime minister, um, but uh, not that much. And you can see sort of, you realize that it's, 
P3, which is uh, P2, P2 is the, the sort of the normal news channels. Uh, P3 is, uh, I don't know what P3 is actually, but they, they, they played music that night. So and they were the only channel that was on. Um, and you can see if you, uh, if you actually find this, uh, then it's uh, 11 over one that they break and, and have this, uh, um, oh, sort of uh, very hastily put together a program uh, telling that uh, old palm has been shot. Uh, if you look at the metadata for in our catalog, it says uh, mixed music, I think, during this period. It is clearly not what happened. Um, so for us, it's a big deal, even if it's not perfect. For us, it's a big deal that we can actually extract a lot of information that we can then, I mean, we can, we can do uh, NER on this, for example. Um, so we can extract a lot of information for where uh, before it was basically black. Uh, and I mean, I think this graph says something as well. I mean, it starts in P3 and then all the other chants wake up. Um, so uh, that was it for me. Thank you.